I'm, I apologize for my abrupt yo. No, just, I love it. What, one yeah. of our one of our rules in the chat is to keep it classy, but I guess our salutations don't have to be classy. Yo to you too. Yo oh, to everybody. I have to keep it classy. <laughs> That's true. We That's haven't extended the classy rule tough. to Sean. <laughs> 844-861-5537 is the call-in number, 844-861-5537. And as always, you can use the chat as long as you keep it classy, is our rule, as has been established. So, a lot of cool things to discuss this Wednesday. First, I am interviewing Lydia Bastianich. For those of you who haven't heard of Lydia, she is a fantastic and very well-known chef and restaurateur. She is actually an Emmy award-winning public television host. She has opened many restaurants all across the country. She has several cookbooks, of which yours truly owns as I am trying to elevate my uh, meal and cooking game. And so we'll be discussing how she got into the business, how all of us, even those of us like me, who are pretty bad at cooking, can elevate any meal, and some kind of behind the scenes secrets or tips of what it's like to run a restaurant, and not just any restaurant, restaurants that have been as successful as Lydia's have been. So that's the first part of the show. Second part of the show, we're going to do something totally pivoting away from anything having to do with cooking, and that is we'll be discussing Afghanistan and the way that Afghanistan has just descended into the dregs since uh, the American withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021. We will be specifically zooming in on what is going on with women in Afghanistan. There are 15 million women and girls who are now being subjected to brutal misogynistic abuse and Sharia law. And as if that is not bad enough, it does seem that ISIS has reestablished a foothold in Afghanistan, which we will be unpacking. And then finally, you know, there are those of you who've been listening to me know that one of my favorite parts of this job is when I get to interact with listeners. That's why I love the chat so much and I have a direct line to the chat right now so I can see your, your comments. I uh, love when people call into the show. And I also really appreciate when people email me and you can email me at julie at julie-hartman.com. And lately I've been getting some emails that have really made me pause. So we're just going to talk about two of those at the end of the show today. But first, do we have our guest, Lydia? Is she ready to go? No, you, you may want to do the emails now. Mm. Oh, or or Afghanistan, your choice. <laughs> Well, again, those of you watching live, you always get to see the behind the scenes of uh, how this works. Yeah, you know, I think that's a good idea. Why don't... Oh, 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 oh. I'm sorry. We have her on the phone, apparently. Okay. Do you want to do it on the phone, or do you want to wait till we can establish video? I think, I think we should wait until we establish video, since that was... Okay, we want it on video. Hold on. Sorry. What was agreed upon? No, this is... <laughs> I'm so thrilled this is happening as we're going live. But... I, let's let's start indeed with the with the listener emails because one listener actually wrote to me and asked me if I could summarize those three kind of main takeaways that I had earlier in the week with regard to that life changing life advice that I got from someone who I had coffee with. For those of you who are totally unaware of what I'm talking about, about please go back to the show on Monday. I give about 20 to 30 minutes of a synopsis of just kind of new realms of life advice uh, and ways of thinking about life that I've been exploring. And so someone wrote in to me and said, could you just kind of distill it into a few TLDRs? And I joke that this life advice is sort of like hippy dippy mumbo jumbo sitting on a high mountain and saying om we need to like bring out our bone broth to talk about these things but they really do pertain to a kind of realm of life that I don't tend to discuss very often and my dear friend and co-host Dennis Prager doesn't tend to discuss very often and that is the realm of your intuition your thoughts your gut what you project. Again, all of that sounds really hippie and sort of incompatible with a lot of what Dennis and I discuss about religion, about rationality, and about logic. 
But what, what I want to say before I answer the email and, and summarize those three things, because the listener also sort of said like this, this seems very different from what you talk about. I actually don't think that this kind of hippie stuff is so far out of the realm of what we usually discuss, or I don't think it actually is incompatible with a belief in God. Because there is so much about the human body and the human mind that we don't understand. It's a total mystery. And we've been kind of fed this stuff in the modern world that we can reduce everything to a scientific proof. And we can show through data and reasoning and scans and journal essays and research and programs, you know, how things work. But that's not always true. There's a lot that's left to wonder in mystery. And so I'll just quickly summarize these three because they're so important and I want people to really know them. The first is so much of life is projection. What you put out into the world is what you will get in return. And this is especially true of what you tell yourself. We discussed on that show on Monday that your thoughts, your mind is really all that you have because it informs how you handle and view your life around you. Yes, there are so many things in life that are out of your control. You could fall sick, you could get fired from your job, you could have to move cities, etc. But the way that you view it in your head is, again, really kind of all that you have amidst many things around you which can change. And so this first piece of advice is so important. And that is, if you are telling yourself bad things, if you're telling yourself, I'm never going to succeed, I'm never going to meet the right person, I'm not good enough, that's the sludge that you're feeding yourself you are going to project that outward. Two people can walk into the same reality and exit with totally different outcomes because of the way that they were talking to themselves. And so that's the, the first TLDR. A lot of life is projection and what you tell yourself, whether it's good or whether it's bad, you are going to push that outward and people are going to sense it and it's going to inform the way that you see life and the way that you make decisions. That's the first thing. The second thing is trusting your gut. Another, I think kind of, uh, not lie, but, but misdirection of the modern world is that everything can be reduced to reason and to logic. And sometimes in life, when you're making decisions, including very fast decisions, you don't have time to think it through. And even if you did think it through, it, that actually may not always lead you to the best conclusion. And so another thing we talked about on that show on Monday is sort of honing your gut. That doesn't mean that you go with, you know, you solely trust your gut and you never make rational decisions, but kind of paying attention to your intuition because your intuition and your gut, as I defined it, is all of the accumulated wisdom of your life. Things that you noticed or things that made an impression on you that maybe you didn't fully realize you noticed or made an impression on you, but are acting in that moment to tell you something that your brain would take a lot longer to figure out. And then the third main takeaway to TLDR, the whole 20, 30 minute episode on Monday, is this idea of radical acceptance. And all of this I have been thinking about so much since Monday, I'm going to follow up with more discussions, more detailed discussions on this show about it. But this idea of radical acceptance is very important because we spend so much of our time relitigating the past and fretting about the future. And yes, at a certain point, you know, you need to go back to the past. You need to figure out what you did right, what you did wrong, how you might be able to change course or improve or continue the things that you did right. And in the future, you need to worry to an extent about the future in order to make sure that you have a good future. But think about how much time in our day we spend in those two realms of life, which have either happened and we can't change or haven't happened yet. And what this individual encouraged me to do is to embrace this idea of radical acceptance with those things that we can't change. Kind of having a calm understanding that things happened in life, things are happening in life, and things will happen in life for a reason. And instead of spending all the mental time to try to concoct a better, perfect reality in your head, 
do the best you can right now and accept the situation for what it is. Should I go into the next listener email? No, I think we've reached a perfect opportunity for you, Julie, to accept reality as it is. <laughs> radical acceptance that this is the situation the way it is and your guest is going to be on the phone and not video. That's okay. I'm delighted so. to welcome the guest in any capacity. I'm so pleased to welcome Lydia Bastianich to the show. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, Lydia is an Emmy award-winning public television host. She's also a best-selling cookbook author and restaurateur. She has owned several restaurants all across the United States, including Felidia in Manhattan and uh, Becco in Manhattan. She's also owned restaurants in Pittsburgh and Kansas City, among other places. In addition to that, she's a partner at Italy locations all around the country, including right here in Los Angeles, but also New York, Chicago, Boston, Las Vegas, Dallas, and even Brazil. And she's the author of several cookbooks. My favorite is uh, her most recently released cookbook. It's called Lydia's From Our Family Table to Yours. More than 100 recipes made with love for all occasions. She also has a fantastic website called lydiasitaly.com, which has all of these sub tabs of various <laughs> recipes that you can uh, make sauces, pastas, desserts, soups. I've especially been trying to spend more time in the sauces sections, and sauces can really elevate any meal in my mind. So, welcome, Lydia, on the phone. <laughs> Wish I could see you, but I wish I could see her, and I certainly wish that I could hear her. So... Hello. Oh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> hi. Yeah, hi, Julie. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming on, and I'm sorry about the technical difficulties, but it's so great to be with you. Let's start My off. Question. Let's start off by talking about your upbringing. Now, I read that you were born in Croatia and you were raised in Yugoslavia. What was your upbringing like and when did you find out that you wanted to be a chef? Julie, let me just uh, sort of set the ground straight. So, I was born in Istria. Istria is a little peninsula. You know, Italy has 20 regions. And uh, way north, north of Venice, there's a few in Venezia, Julia, and there's a little peninsula called Italy. And that was all Italy uh, uh, into, into part of Dalmatia, too. World War II, Italy lost the war. So I was born when it was right at the end of the war, 1947, or 1944. And that part of the world, which was Italy, was given to the newly formed communist Yugoslavia. So Yugoslavia came in with Tito, and uh, the really thing it was communism, it was we couldn't speak Italian, we couldn't practice our religion, and many things. And then Yugoslavia broke up into different uh, little countries, which now is Croatia. Mm -hmm. So that, that area underwent different political situations. Wow. So when did you decide that you wanted to be a chef and did your, your upbringing and your experiences in Yugoslavia somehow inform that decision and career path? Uh, it's, I, it did, uh, Julie. You know, so going back to 1947, right after the war, that area was still sort of uh, under the Allied forces. They were monitoring it until they decided ultimately to draw the border. But it was after the war, and there was a scarce, scarce, scarce food, and the situation was bad. And my mother, who was a school teacher, my father was a mechanic, but my grandmother lived in a little town right outside. I was born in, now it's called Pula. At that time, it was called Pola, P-O-L-A in Italian, P-U-L-A in Croatian now. And uh, grandma supplied the food for the family, the whole family, not just my family. So grandma had, we, we had chickens, we had ducks, we had goats. I would milk the goats. We had two pigs, and every November we would have, uh, we would make prosciutto and sausages. And and, uh, and then, of course, the garden. She had the garden, and she would send me out to get the peas in the springtime, dig out the potatoes, get the onions. So even as a youngster, and I'm talking about eight, nine, ten years old, I was involved in this 
food, the producing of food. But with it went the appreciation, uh, the, the, the gratefulness of having food at our table. Mm. And you know, I would need with her the bread. I would make pasta with her. I was her little helper. Go get me some rosemary. And I would run by the rosemary bush and bring it, or bay leaves or whatever. And I think that was my foundation, it was the foundation where sort of I absorbed all those flavors and the smells and the aromas, and they stayed with me. I think the, the pivotal point in me really getting into cooking was, uh, 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 Julie, because uh, my parents in 1956 decided that they could no longer live under those conditions. And uh, we couldn't immigrate because the borders went down and that was, that was the end we, we were there to stay. But we had relatives on Trieste, on the Italian side. So my mother, my brother and I were given the visa to go to visit family. They wouldn't let the whole family go. My father had to stay behind. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we went to the visitors. About 10 days later, my father appeared at night at the door. He was all dirty. He literally escaped uh, the border, and they chased him. And then our, our journey as immigrants began. And I realized that, you know, I wasn't going back to grandma. I didn't say goodbye to grandma. So I was longing for those experiences. And I think in me. You know, the food, the smells and all that that I left behind, those were memories of grandma. They, they bought mm. grandma. And I cooked ever more and I cooked with passion because those those smells, that those flavors brought back my childhood memories, the memories that I love being with grandma, with my animals. And it stayed as a passion thereafter. You know, I learned, uh, I kind of sensed that how food was important, how food was a communicator how food was a nurturer, how you can express emotion, uh, show emotion with food, tell someone you love with food. And, you know, it's been my passion, and I've been cooking ever since, and uh, delightfully feeding people and nurturing people, my family and beyond. What a great history discussion, and of course a a great discussion about the history of you and and how this has uh, in, informed your, your passion for cooking. You know, I was watching a video of yours over the weekend and you just kind of offhandedly said something uh, as an aside about how much, for, how, how for much of human history, it took an amazing amount of effort and labor into making a Sunday meal. It was like a, an all day venture. And it just reminded me of that when, when you were saying that you grew up with goats and, you know, growing the, the food. I think it seems that, that you gained a real appreciation for all that goes in to making what maybe we look at as a simple dish. And nowadays we very much take for granted all of the labor that goes into such a, a great tasting and great looking meal. Absolutely, Julie. I remember, you know, Sunday was the bigger meal, if you will. And usually, you know, we had some proteins. Uh, chicken was usually it or a rabbit. But I remember, I remember plucking the chicken, the hot water. I remember my grandmother, you know, when you pluck all the feathers, then there's, there's, there's this little kind of uh, the baby feathers. And she would burn that over an open fire. And I can remember helping her. I remember all those details. Wow. Uh, and... Now, even in the chicken inside, you can see the, the small eggs, the egg size of, of uh, 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 cranberries, and then how the egg, uh, you know, as a child, it's a, it's a lesson in, in science, if you will, in biology. The chicken would open, and you see these little eggs all attached to the cluster of eggs uh, that the chicken had in, and how it got bigger. And then even the, the eggs had a soft shell and ultimately had the heart shell when it came out. So all this, this was, you know, it was like, like the training of, of, of a surgeon or somebody. I was in there, right in there. And I was saying, you, you just can't forget, you can't forget the flavors, you can't forget the smells, and most of all, the appreciation. The appreciation, how everything was respected. That chicken, from the to the feet, hmm. to the all of that made a good soup. And then the sauce, nothing goes away. Hmm. So I'm curious how you got to a place of such immense success in this industry. I I know a lot about many industries and how competitive they are, but frankly, I know nothing about the restaurant uh, or cooking uh, industry. So 
how does that kind of work? What does it take to to make well, it? Is it incredibly competitive? It's competitive. You have to put a lot of work. But I think the most important thing is that you have a passion for what you do. That there's a reason. And I think in the beginning, the emotions that go with cooking for me, I think, was the underlying kind of uh, driving force. I realized that I could connect with people. But also, coming to the United States, I came to the United States because when we escaped back to Italy, we spent two years in a refugee camp in, in Trieste. And in 1958, we came to the United States. We were brought here by the Catholic Charities. We had no family here. So coming as a young immigrant, not speaking the language, but I was very excited. I was excited because, you know, you kind of begin to talk about America and the greatness of America and leaving behind this uh, aftermath of war, this difficulties of really not being who you are, not being able to speak your language and all that. So I was, we were looking forward to it. My parents certainly were in bringing their children and education. And I came here, I was 12, so I had a great opportunity in my lifetime to begin. To begin, I had most of my education here. And alongside of the education, I always used food as, as a sort of uh, 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 to lean on, to make a little extra money. I worked in bakeries, uh, baking, and then ultimately I got into baking. When I, when I worked in... in uh, and when I went to college, I went in restaurants, uh, you know, all the college kids, and I went in the kitchen and cooked. As a, so I progressed in my passion because I knew that I could do that, that it was good, and it would make me that extra money that I could uh, help to uh, the family and for my future, for my future school and buying, buying things for myself. Uh, and then ultimately, I did meet my husband, who was also an immigrant, from the same area, mind you, and he was in the industry, and he wanted to open a restaurant. And I said, okay, I will help you. And at that time, I mean, I was a fairly good cook. I was not a chef. But we had we opened a little restaurant, nine tables, and uh, we hired a chef. And I realized that uh, I needed to learn. And I went into the kitchen with the chef, and I was there for 10 years as a sous chef. But beyond that, Mm. I, I went back to school. You know, I was interested in the science. I was interested in the anthropology of food. I would take courses between lunch and dinner sometimes. You know, I would take courses uh, at college, actually. I would go to Queen's College right here. And uh, I still, to this day, I'm very curious. I want to know food is such a, such a basis. Food is such a common denominator, no matter what culture you are, uh, uh, where you are in this world. Food is the connecting element. Mm -hmm. You can connect with somebody with food. You give, you offer somebody food, and it's the sign of it. It's fascinating that you were a sous chef for 20 years, and you went back to ten. school. I mean, ten. Oh, 10. Ten. Excuse me, 10. ten. It's still a lot. <laughs> a decade <laughs> is still a long time. And you were just continuing to learn and learn and learn. And I really think that in order to be successful at any industry, you need two ingredients apropos of our of our discussion. The first is what you said about passion. You have to love what you do. But I think yeah. the second thing, and I'm I'm learning this from you too, is that you you have to keep going and working and and doing it over and over and over again and refining your craft. And that does take a long time to hone. Absolutely. You know, I was as I was waiting to come into your show I was listening to you and talking about women. And I, I speak a lot to women group. I, I'm asked to speak. Then usually, you know, it's, you know, as a woman. And I tell the women, all of them, I never looked at myself uh, as, as a woman in my profession. I always looked at myself as a professional. I said, gender doesn't matter. You need to be good at what you do. You need to be passionate. You need to invest in yourself. And once you own what you do and you do well, and you need to continue to feed that, that information, all of that, then you are, you move ahead, you go on, people respect you. It's not a question of, and our industry, uh, it is tough uh, for women uh, in, in the actual behavioral status, status of a kitchen of that. But as a professional, as success, my success was all about this commitment, this love. I just, Never consider myself or look at myself or, or, 
or expected to be treated differently because I was a woman. No, I was a professional. I wanted to be the best of what I did. And, you know, when, you, when I saw, when I began to enter all the, 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 the sort of the society of chefs, this big, hot, uh, the toques and all of that, I never wore a toque. But, you know, all these different fancy uh, cooking or whatever, I, I had a message. I knew what I wanted. I wanted my traditional, the Italian culture, and I wanted to bring it to my new family, the new culture that accepted me so, so wonderfully. I wanted my two cultures to connect, and food was my way. And so I, I was true till this day. I am true to the tradition of Italian cuisine. I am not an inventive chef. Mm. And I stuck to that, and uh, in doing that, of course, I, I do continue and it got me where I am because, you know, uh, I am true to form. I am true to a culture. And I am true because I want to transport this. I want to teach this to all the great American populace that has accepted me and that has given me these opportunities. I love what you said, that you didn't think of yourself as a woman. You thought of yourself as a professional and you wanted to make yourself the best. We obviously live in this society now where people really obsess about gender and race and your immutable characteristics. And, you know, the and of course, as you said, there there are challenges for for people, for women. You know, th there's sure. no denying that. But. I think in a meritocratic system like the United States, the beauty is nobody really cares if you're a woman or a man as a chef. They care that you're making them a good meal. I mean, I, I know I certainly don't care. I don't care if an Oompa Loompa made my pasta. I want to make sure my pasta is, you know, all I care about is that my pasta is good. And so in, in, in this country, a really great liberating thing that we so take for granted is that overall, we really do judge people based on the merits of the, their product, based on if they are the best instead of, you know, what their identity is as the, the person behind it. And this doesn't apply only to food and cooking. You know, I think cooking and nurturing and feeding was a female's world from the beginning. Yeah. Then the male took it on as a true profession, opening restaurants, whether it was after the French Revolution, whatever. You know, these, these chefs, these court chefs uh, uh, began opening their own restaurants and so on. And I think they might have been afraid of the women reclaiming <laughs> their, their, <laughs> their kitchen. That is, but that's not the case, you know. I think that uh, people and chefs and male chefs ever more understand if you're talented, if you're good, if you do a good, whether it's a cake, whether it's a bread, whether it's a pasta, then you're appreciated and you're wanted. And so what does that take? It takes to invest in yourself, the passion, the desire to work, to work with people who you admire. To learn from, you know, learn from the masters, the school of the masters, going back to the great painters and all of that. They had their own little schools and they had all the apprentices. And that's very important in our industry that you do work with the masters. And, you know, at this point, point in my career, you know, I'm 50 years that I had restaurants. Uh, one of the most rewarding things is, is to pass on the knowledge and to to share whether it's with my new chefs or whether it is going to a school or, or giving lectures or whatever. I want to know your advice that you would give to people who are considering opening a restaurant. What was the most difficult thing about opening a restaurant? And what are some of the kind of behind the scenes secrets of what makes a restaurant so popular? Well, now things are really difficult because the finances are so high. To mm. open a restaurant, you know, uh, to build it, uh, the real estate, everything is very expensive. So you need to have a good stash, a good backing behind you. And that usually now involves having partners, monetary, financial partners to, to help you out. So a good thing, uh, uh, one of the first things to consider is to be financially secure. Because to really get a restaurant going, uh, it takes about, uh, the first three months are very tough. Then mm. another it takes a year to really sort of get known out there somewhat and bring in the money to cover because there's a lot of expenses in the in the restaurant business. Uh, the second thing is to have a sense of business. 
If you don't, you know, I know that initially uh, I didn't. I didn't take courses in finance, uh, but I did surround myself with a good accountant, and I would ask questions. So it's important because it's not a solitary journey. Mine is not a solitary victory. Mine is a team victory, whether it's my family, my mother, all the people that worked alongside of me. And, and that's important to select and collect people that are very capable and competent and that are complementary to you and that add to you. Yes, the vision that whatever is, is yours, but to build a team. And I think what's most important is that, again, that you know your craft, mm-hmm. that you have something different or unique or wonderful or beautiful or delicious to offer to people. And people now are more than ever educated between, you know, the Internet and all of that. You know, everybody knows the recipes. They can check it out. They can test it and whatever. So people are very informed. So if you're going to sort of predicate something and, 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 and put it out there, you better be sure that it is right on, that it is what you feel you want to give them, that, that it is your profile because people enjoy the difference. You know, I mean, you can have a carbonara anywhere, but there's certain chefs that you appreciate their carbonara. So you have to offer that uniqueness also. And I think that also, you know, the respect of, of uh, the culture in dining also, welcoming people, making them feel at home, uh, 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 extending, opening that, you know, sometimes uh, uh, I think my, certainly mine, especially the initial restaurant, was just that. It was like a home. I mean, I would be in the kitchen. I would come up with my slippers. You know, in Italy, the, the, the women cook with their slippers. They don't have these. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be comfortable. But yeah, I came out, I used to come out with my slippers, with my apron and whatever, and I used to go around the table. And <clears throat> I sometimes would make something different that was you know, completely different, not even the menu. And I would bring it from table to table to let them taste. And I was excited that they would, that they would, whether they like it, but I also got a feedback, you know, do they like it? Should I go on doing things like this or not? So, you know, it is that connection with your guests, with your customers and the respect for them. You know, they are paying for that. They, they, they are supporting, you know, I mean, uh, uh, for me, all these years, 50 years, 25 years of public television, 16 books, there's, those people out there, uh, I just feel like, I can't tell me, Lydia, we feel like you're, you're my family, and I feel like they are the extension, uh, because they have supported me. They have been on my side all these years. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. I love what you just said about cooking something and going out and testing it with people because that is such a nice way to make them feel at home and to make them feel appreciated and create a kind of family in the restaurant. And as you say, also test out and see if people like it or don't like it. You know, we we live in a world now where very sadly, so many things are impersonal. This is such a dumb example, but I was in a workout class this morning and I was thinking about that. And I said, you know, I go to this workout class every single morning and I see the same instructor and I kind of see some of the same people, but we just don't know each other. You know, we come in, we work out, we leave. A lot of restaurants are like that. Here in Los Angeles, where I live, by the way, are are you in Brooklyn, Lydia? Where are you now? I'm in Queens. Oh, you're in Queens. And it's pouring rain here. And it's pouring rain. I'm jealous. I love it when it pours rain because in L.A. we're spoiled with sunshine. So I I enjoy the rain sometimes. But here in Los Angeles, there are so many restaurants, and I I really want to hear your opinion on these, um, where they are not only impersonal, but they're so rude to you. You'll make a reservation at a certain time. They won't they'll go, Oh, we'll let you know when your table's ready. They'll seat you 20 minutes later. And it's, you know, one of these she, she restaurants that everybody says you got to go to with a very cool atmosphere. You get your food. The food's not even that good. What do you make of those restaurants? They do seem to be immensely popular despite being impersonal and really not that great. Yeah, Julie, Julie, absolutely. You know, it's a sense of empowerment. Mm. When they when they are booked and they can say no to somebody, that's a power, according and especially a lot of these young that you know, are young and here they are, they're manning the doors of a of a restaurant 
And it's so easy to say, no, I don't have a seat. No, it's a sense of empowerment. And it, it, they're missing. They're missing that, that point of, of uh, that is in the service, that is serving people, that is welcoming people. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, uh, it, it, it is turning around in a sense. I think people realize that. But uh, sadly or whatever uh, enough, uh, the world is uh, getting so uh, uh, technical and Internet and fast, industrial and whatever. And uh, that sometimes, you know, as, as the human element, which you're, you were talking about, that you couldn't sense it in your training, if nothing. And, uh, you know, I just came back from Venice yesterday and I went uh, up to Istria and I spent... Easter with with my cousins or whatever, and it's in the same little town that my grandmother was. The courtyard, I fixed it a little bit, but it's the same. Some of the neighbors, the kids, and there's there's a human element that I need to connect periodically uh, mm. with, and that's what you're saying that you're missing, and it is so so necessary. Yes, the family is part of that, friends are part of that, but also you know neighbors. Uh, helping each other and all of that. And I think that uh, hopefully maybe uh, ever more we'll get back to that need. Although, you know, with the Internet and these, these things where we don't need anybody else except this this little machine, I don't know where it's taking us. Mm. You know, just as an aside, Lydia, totally off topic, I just did a little segment on Giotto, and I have also been trolled by listeners for not pronouncing him correctly. It's apparently Giotto. Giotto. You mean Giotto? Giotto, yes. I, I, <laughs> my producer's <laughs> laughing at me. I know I'm going to get a lot of laughs from listeners, but you said you were just I, in Venice. He's my favorite artist, and he has the Arena Chapel in Venice. He is my favorite chapel. I love his wow. blues. I love his the stars in the sky. Yes. Uh, oh, it's you know, it's maybe maybe his figures are a little flat. They're not you know so tri-dimensional as you move on in, in, in the art history, but I love him. In the arena chapel, everybody should go and see that. I, I did a whole show on it, Lydia, which I encourage you to watch if, if you're interested. I, I love, especially in addition to the blue and the stars that you mentioned, the seven virtues and the seven vices that he paints, yes. and they're so funny. Like the way he paints the, the vice of infidelity, they, there's a guy with a woman, an idol holding an idol of a woman, and it's chained to him. Anyway, we're we we can talk about art sometime. Well, it, you know, my daughter, my daughter Tanya, and I think you connected with I her. Did, she, yes, she has a PhD for, in, from Oxford in Renaissance art history. So oh. you know, I think that yes, I love to cook, and uh, that's my passion. But you know, what fuels me and my creativity is is art, it's music, it's nature. Mm. We need. We need these things so much. So I'm delighted that you, and that is one of my favorite painters. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm glad I brought it up well, <laughs> as an aside. I am from that area, the Veneto, the Venetian, because all of that was the Serenissima, where I was born, the Venetian city-state, you know, that ruled for over, what, 900 years. Uh, and uh, mm. it's, uh, uh, I, love, I love his work. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Lydia. You've been so generous. I do have a few more questions for you, if if that is okay. But um, I, yeah. I, I do want to ask, you know, what are some tips for, for those of us who are going to restaurants? I know, for instance, and, and by the way, I have no idea if this is true. It could be a myth that you are not supposed to order fish on Mondays because the fish is old. What are some things like that that, that people should know? Well, you know, it, it, it is, you know, you want it, you want everything as fresh as possible, as seasonal. So, you know, mind, keep, keep, you know, what season is it? Uh, do, do, do we have strawberries uh, in uh, December? No, unless they're flown from someplace, Florida or whatever. So why have strawberries, you know? Have uh, uh, December, January, uh, citrus uh, months, you know? Have, so look at the season uh, and, and a day like Different, you know, yes, you know, the fisher, Sunday's off, supposedly, uh, in the old fisherman. And on Monday, 
of course, you don't get much fish. So do you not eat fish on Monday? I think today everything is sort of uh, flown and it is uh, caught and it is frozen on the boat as soon as it is caught. And that's not bad. That's not a bad idea. It's better than that it, it is just iced and entered. So if it's uh, frozen from the boat, uh, it is perfectly fine. Because being informed, venues should inform you, you know, where is is the salmon from Nova Scotia? Is the salmon from the West Coast? Is the salmon, salmon uh, wild salmon? Is it, you know, I think, and you, you should ask also those, those questions. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, to I, annoy the waiter. <laughs> Well, but but no, I think if you if you if you do it, I I, I think you know a, a waiter that loves what he does or that he enjoys what he does, and if you ask him nice nice in a in a conversational tone, should right. be absolutely should be absolutely fine. Um, I think you know, and uh, you should face out the restaurant. You know, who is the chef? Read some of the reviews. Uh, some of the, the what the what the people are reviewing, and uh, no, because different restaurants have different strengths. You know, some restaurants are great at pasta, some are, are risottos. Some of in Italy, it holds true also that regionally, you know, if you want to eat certain things, you go in the region that you know. Linguine clamso is a Neapolitan dish. It's served all over Italy, but it's best of all in Naples, mm. and this. Uh, 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 orecchiette with, with broccoli di rape and sausage Puglia. This is Puglia the heel. It's best there. Yes, it's served around Italy, but it is best there. And so I, what is best in Rome, Lydia? I'm going to Rome in a few days. Are you? Okay. Rome is uh, uh, a very sort of uh, 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 simple Piblian, if you will, menu. Pasta, amatriciana. Cacio e pepe, uh, uh, carbonara, uh, there is tripa, tripe, uh, there is oxtail, braisings, uh, all of that. Sort of every part of the animal is used, and the animals that are uh, used a lot is the, the, the uh, hog, uh, the, the pig, um, let's see, gnocchi alla romana, uh, lots of chicory and green vegetables. And now in the spring, I'm pretty sure. Don't miss the braised artichoke. Everybody should go eat braised artichoke, stuffed artichoke, artichokes. Anyway, and chicory. It's also the season for chicory. Have a lot of chicory, garlic, and oil with a little peperoncino. Stay in season, stay local. I did not expect for you to say artichoke, but I am totally delighted and, and will uh, send you pictures of it. So. Do that. Finally, Lydia, and again, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. And I, I love love your work, love your YouTube channel. What are some ways that everyday people who may not be so skilled at cooking, like yours truly, <laughs> what are some ways that we can elevate any meal? What are some spices or maybe oils or things that we can have on hand just to kind of kick it up a notch? And I will make reference to what I know, and that is Italian cuisine. Okay. And and really get as close as you, you can to Italy by using the traditional Italian. That is, meaning good olive oil. But pecorino romano, or pecorino toscano, or grana padano, or parmigiano, or prosciutto di parma, all of these traditional ingredients will bring to your table immediately the flavor of Italy. Mozzarella. So, and the, the, the secret is not to elaborate them. If they are traditional, they have a traditional flavor, a traditional finish to them. You don't need to elaborate them, you know. Uh, so, sometimes one feels, oh, if I don't cook, it's not happening. The simplest, get the best ingredients and the least ingredients possible and the simplest preparation. Begin with that. You know, spaghetti, garlic, and oil. If you have a great oil, some good garlic, and uh, and uh, prepare on cheese, and you just cook it. You know the secret of spaghetti, garlic, and oil. So l let me go through the through the recipe a little bit. Oil, sure. spice garlic. Let it let it sort of become golden. Put pepperoncino 
And then while the pasta is cooking, take a little bit of the pasta water, a ladle or two, and put it right in that oil. It's going to fizzle a little bit. But, and then throw the parsley and let that cook while the pasta finishes cooking. And that's going to make the sauce. And then you just pull up the pasta from the water, drain it or just pick it up, put it in that uh, kind of saucy garlic and oil and dress it. And it is finished. It is simple. It is delicious. Try it tonight. I will. <laughs> I absolutely will. Finally, I do promise this will be the last question, but we have a question in the chat. Does Lydia have a favorite vegetarian recipe? Vegetarian? Mm-hmm. Oh, I love vegetables. So now is, you know, I went, as I said, I went to uh, to Eastia, and one of the things that I love doing in this time of the year is go foraging for wild asparagus. So I must say, yeah, I can't find them here. So I'm going to talk about them, but it's going to be difficult. To <laughs> but one of my favorite is the wild asparagus. But now in springtime, you have the flowers, you have the artichokes, you have the chicory, just what I told you. I ate, I steamed the chicory and I boiled an egg and you toss it with oil and vinegar and salt and pepper. And it's a delicious, delicious meal. And, you know, chicory is so good for you. Yeah, even the liquid where you boil the, the chicory, my grandmother used to let it cool and uh, she would drink it. And it's very, very healthy. Wow. So, uh, but but then, you know, what I what I also, I love the cabbage. Man. I love savoy cabbage. Uh, I make savoy cabbage. Uh, I, I cook a few potatoes. I took potatoes in the water. I cook them. When they're half cooked, I take a savoy cabbage head and shred it and throw it in with the potatoes. And when they're both cooked, I drain them and then some garlic and oil in the pan, and I rocky mash them. It is the best. I'm hungry. <laughs> You've done your job. You've All made right. me very, very hungry. Lydia, thank you so much. And as a reminder to everyone, Lydia's most recent cookbook is Lydia's From Our Family Table to Yours, More Than 100 Recipes Made with Love for All Occasions. And please do go to her YouTube channel as well as lydiasitaly.com for all of the fantastic recipes that Lydia has to offer. Lydia, thank you so much for being here. And please tell your daughter, Tanya, that I will be emailing her about Renaissance art. Okay, Julie. You should have her on the show. I, oh, I totally will. <laughs> I absolutely right. will. Have a nice room. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye, bye bye. Sean, are you hungry? When we were talking about uh, our uh, trusting your gut on Monday, you said I think with my gut all the time. I'm thinking with yeah. my gut right now. No, I've been uh, salivating for about half an hour now. <laughs> yeah. Braised artichokes. I'm jealous. I know. I'll you send you on. some braised artichokes in uh, Rome. Totally not what I was expecting her to say, but, you know, good tips she are good tips. One of the most interesting accents that I've ever heard. It was Yugoslavian, it was Italian, and, even, and then when she said Wada, you could hear the Brooklyn in her. It yes. was amazing. Well, yeah. you know, my favorite part of that discussion you can probably guess what it was, it was when she was talking about how she just wanted to make herself competent. And that's really what it is. And, and as she was saying, and I know I remarked this, but it really is such a blessing that although this is changing and rapidly changing, we do live in a country where people are primarily judged, even amidst all this crazy crap about DEI and race and gender, all, even amidst all that, we still have this culture where we really primarily judge people based on the merits of their product. That's a really, really cool thing. And boy, she's done it. I also so. wonder if a, if an accomplished chef like that ever has a double cheeseburger or eats <laughs> I should Cheetos. have asked that. Yeah, like, <laughs> how, how do you stay slim when working yeah. as a chef? <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Well, before we talk about Afghanistan, let's talk about something a little lighter than Afghanistan, and that's my pillow. So as you know, I use a lot of my pillow products. I sleep on a my pillow. I use the Giza Dream bed sheets. I use my towels, and of course, I wear my slippers, my favorite product. And and you can get many of these products at a discount if you use the promo code Hartman. And in fact, right now you will get immense discounts on many MyPillow products because they're having a $25 extravaganza. Two pack multi use My Pillows for $25. My Pillow Sandals for $25. Six pack towel sets, $25. Brand new four pack dish towels, you guessed it. $25 and for the first time ever, the premium MyPillows with all new Giza fabric are just 
$75. If you spend over $75, you will also get free shipping. Just go to MyPillow.com and use the promo code Hartman or call 1-800-566-6745 and use the promo code Hartman. Spelled with one N and no E. So let's transition from cooking and pasta and carbonara and artichoke to Afghanistan. Welcome to Timeless, right? Talking about all sorts of things. Well, what's going on in Afghanistan is nothing short of devastating. As many of you are probably aware, President Biden made the decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan in 2021, 20 years after we went into Afghanistan to overthrow the Taliban. That was one of President Biden's biggest uh, campaign pushes. In fact, with all that came out with Robert Hur about the classified uh, document scandal with President Biden, we found that a, a lot of the classified documents that he was harboring pertained to the Obama administration's debates about Afghanistan. President Biden really wanted to make it a part of his legacy that he was one of the few people at the time in that administration who wanted the United States out. And we got out, that's for sure, with terrible uh, tragedies in the wake. Many of us remember those videos of uh, people flocking to the airplanes that were taking off uh, at the Kabul airport, flying to the United States, people literally trying to hang on to the planes to desperately get out of Afghanistan. There was also, of course, a tragedy at that Kabul airport where 13 American military members were killed in an ISIS terrorist attack. That group, that ISIS branch who carried out that terrorist attack in 2021 is the same group which carried out the recent terrorist attack in Moscow, which killed over 130 people. So I want to talk about what has happened in the wake of that Afghanistan withdrawal. And there have been two main things. Well, there have been many things, but but the two things that we'll focus on are first, what has happened pertaining to women. There are 15 million women and girls in Afghanistan right now, and they are subjected to the most brutal, misogynistic, barbaric Sharia law. And then the second main kind of development is that ISIS seems to have had a reappearance, shall we say, in the country of Afghanistan. But first, I sort of want to back up and talk a bit about the whole decision of going in in the first place and then the decision of leaving. And by the way, a few months ago, right here on Timeless, I interviewed a man named James Hassan on the show. He is a former captain in the United States Army, and he actually won a Bronze Star Medal for his service in Afghanistan. And he wrote a riveting book, which we discussed and I recommend to anyone interested in the subject, called Kabul, The Untold Story of Biden's Fiasco and the American Warriors Who Fought Until the End. So please do check out that episode of, of the disaster that ensued with the withdrawal. But you know, many people, when talking about the withdrawal, go back to the entry, which many, I think appropriately deem to be misguided. Obviously, in the aftermath of 9-11, Americans were reeling from 3,000 lives lost, a terrible terrorist attack that came as a shock to our country, and it was very much in the American uh, public support to seek some kind of retaliation. So obviously, we invaded Iraq. That was completely misguided as far as weapons of mass destruction. Saddam Hussein and his Ba'athist party did not have anything to do with 9-11. He was no doubt a terrible, evil dictator, but for the purposes of our going in to seek vengeance and revenge for 9-11 and to exact, to, to bring justice for 9-11, that was completely misguided. Afghanistan was also, in my view, quite misguided because... The Taliban was running Afghanistan, and as evil and brutal as the Taliban is and was, and as anti-American and jihadist as the Taliban is and was, the Taliban also did not have a direct tie to 9-11. Now, 
allow me to to flesh that out a little bit before you go wait a minute Al Qaeda, who, which was the terrorist group headed by Osama bin Laden, which carried out the attacks on 9-11, they were operating in Afghanistan. They were in the mountains of Afghanistan training their fighters for the September 11th, 2001 assault. So perhaps in that way, the Taliban in Afghanistan was connected to 9-11. The whole argument was that they were providing safe harbor to terrorists. However, there is also evidence that the Taliban did not know that Al Qaeda was going to carry out the attacks on 9-11. They knew that Al Qaeda was up to jihadist and anti-American activity. Of course, Al Qaeda was behind the bombing in the World Trade Center basement in, 2000, in uh, excuse me, 1995. Is that right? 1990 or maybe it was 1993. Uh, forgive me for for not remembering that that date correctly. So so obviously they knew that the that Al Qaeda was was not up to to good things, but the Taliban, according to this growing evidence, did not know that they would carry out that attack on 9/11. And one of the great mistakes in American foreign policy with regard to our yes, Sean, what was it? 1993. Oh, yeah, 1993. 1993. Yep. One of the the great problems with the American uh, course of action with regard to the Middle East in the early 2000s is that we tend we tended to think of the Middle East and the Islamic world as a monolith. And we thought, oh, well, the Taliban and Al Qaeda are basically the same. And if Al Qaeda is op operating in the mountains and the Taliban knows about it and endorses it. And once ISIS came along, we kind of like all view these entities as monolithic. And certainly, many of them, as we especially see right now with, the, with uh, the, the war in Israel, with Hezbollah and Hamas and Iran aiding Israel, obviously many of these terrorist, Islamic, jihadist organizations work in tandem with one another. But we failed to recognize and understand that there were great divisions within these groups. Between, uh, along sectarian lines, between Sunni and Shia, along the different uh, caliphates that those individual groups wanted to restore. And in fact, many of these groups actually were opposing each other at times. And instead of being shrewd enough to recognize that we should seek to divide those groups by pursuing these invasions, we ended up bringing a lot of these groups closer together in their opposition of our invasion. So there of course, is very legitimate reason for people to say, okay, why did we invade Afghanistan? We should have done targeted drone strikes on the terrorists who are responsible for 9-11. We shouldn't have sent U.S. troops and military equipment and all of those things to Afghanistan. But just because we made that mistake invading in 2001 does not mean that we should have exited in 2021. Because at that point, we had achieved our goal we overthrew the Taliban. We had a pretty stable presence there. We, they adopted a Western constitution. They, we had military bases and obviously military troops in Afghanistan. And things were stable. Again, you can argue you shouldn't go into a country and set up military bases. We shouldn't have been there in the first place. Putting that aside, once we were there, the situation was relatively stable. In fact, if you look at the numbers of the American, uh, of, of the numbers of American servicemen, uh, service people, I should say, who died in Afghanistan between 2015 to 2020, it is actually quite small. And of course, any American life lost, any, is one too many. But look at these numbers from 2015 to 2020. 22, 9, 14, 14, 21, and 11 American service people were killed in those respective chronological years. And so in one day, that day when that ter terrible terrorist attack happened at the Kabul airport killing 13 American service people, in that one day, we it killed more American service people in Afghanistan than had happened in an entire year. 
at least for, for one year. In 2016, nine were killed. In, in 2015, 22 were killed. But you understand my point. In that one day, we had a comparable amount killed as an, in, as an entire year. Of course, when we first invaded Afghanistan, there were far more American service people who were killed. But by the end, it really was relatively stable. So withdrawing did not seem to be the right course of action and withdrawing in the way that the Biden administration did, which, as outlined in James Hassan's book, was so uh, disorganized, was so sudden, uh, was really without backup plan and a backup support, that has turned out to be a disaster. And just how much, you might ask? Well, let's look here at what has happened just in these past three years almost with women the 15 million women and girls in Afghanistan. So once the Taliban took over Afghanistan and seized, by the way, billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars of American military equipment, they got rid of the Western constitution that the American military had established, and they reinstated Sharia law. Well, in addition to Sharia law, which is but also a part of Sharia law, is that they outlawed beauty salons in Afghanistan. So women cannot run a beauty salon, nor can they go to a beauty salon, because apparently it is unhealthy for women to have that kind of vanity and femininity. And having that kind of vanity and femini femininity may arouse men. And so women may not go to seek appoint beauty appointments out of fear that it may arouse men. So they've outlawed beauty salons. Many women are confined to the home. They need a male chaperone in order to exit the home. They also need a male's permission to work and to obtain an education. There are very few options even within those categories. Of course, women cannot hold public office in Afghanistan, government office. They are required, of course, to wear hijabs. And the Taliban recently announced that they are bringing back flogging and stoning for adultery. And they have stoned publicly dozens and dozens of people in the past year for the alleged crime of adultery. According to Sahar Fetrat, who is a uh, researcher at Human Rights Watch, she is Afghan, and by the way, this is uh, compiled, um, this, this quote is compiled by hotair.com, always giving my source citations because... Ding! Julie Hartman, not gay. Not Claudine Gay. I'm not going to <laughs> not properly cite when I uh, get good information. Uh, according to Sahar Fetrat, she said, quote, two years ago, the Taliban didn't have the courage that they have today to vow stoning women to death in public. Now they do. They tested their draconian policies one by one and have reached this point because there is no one to hold them accountable for these abuses. Well, that's exactly right. We were in Afghanistan. We left. We don't have any kind of presence there. And we've allowed our enemy who we gave billions of dollars and sacrificed hundreds of American lives to over in 20 years to overthrow, we have allowed them to come back and with no accountability, abuse and subjugate women and girls, and not just women and girls, but the entire population. As if that is not horrible enough, it seems that ISIS has reestablished a presence in Afghanistan. Now, during President Trump's time in office, he was amazingly successful at carrying out drone strikes, which basically eliminated ISIS in the key areas that they were operating. But now ISIS-K, which again is that Afghan group, which was responsible for the Moscow terrorist attack and was responsible for that 2021 Kabul, uh, Kabul excuse me, airport attack, they seem to have come back to Afghanistan with a presence. According to General Frank McKenzie, who is retired, but he was in charge of the United States forces in Afghanistan during President Biden's uh, withdrawal in 2021, he said, quote, that the threat is growing for ISIS-K to carry out a terrorist attack in the United States. 
because if they're establishing themselves again in Afghanistan and there's no, you know, American watch to prevent them, there aren't drone strikes to eliminate them. They're gathering and, and they have all of our equipment that we left behind and, you know, resources. They're going to use that to further their jihadist activity. So General McKenzie said that the threat is growing and it began to grow as soon as we left Afghanistan because, he says, it took the pressure off ISIS-K. He goes on to say we should expect further attempts of this nature. He's talking about terrorist attacks, referring to Moscow. Um, we should expect further attempts of this nature against the United States, as well as our partners and other nations abroad. I mean, I don't mean this in a mean way, but duh. I mean, of course that's going to happen, right? When we have such terrible, terrible policies to allow these uh, terrorists to come back. Isn't it amazing, by the way, how much can be unraveled in three years, three and a half years? Like, th three and a half years ago, ICE, the threat of ISIS was pretty much eliminated. And three and a half years later, the threat of ISIS is very much back. And then finally, General McKinsey said, quote, in Afghanistan, we, the United States, have almost no ability to see in that country and almost no ability to strike in that country. Yes, we have gotten rid of our, our military bases and our surveillance to keep an eye out against our greatest enemies. So God knows what those individuals are doing and planning in Afghanistan. It just, it's, it's, it's deja vu, you know? These terrorists operating in Afghanistan, we don't have a handle on it, we don't have a watch, and they're seeming to plan and will be likely to carry out a terrible event in the United States. We're, we're basically in the situation right now that we were before 9-11, but we tried all of those years and dedicated all of these resources and money and equipment and sacrificed American lives to try to get rid of that, but we didn't. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. But again, this, this point that I made about how much can change is so important because strength matters. And at the risk of sound, sounding heavy handed, this is something that we have to consider in the 2024 election. And it is not just with regard to Afghanistan, but so many, so many situations internationally. Of course, domestically, our country has gone way downhill over the past three years. But it is staggering to trace how much the international order has gone awry in these three years. Giving the example, of course, of the, of the Middle East is, is one component of it. But let's even consider our southern border. That is a international crisis because according to the FBI, there are many on the terrorist watch list. Uh, a uh, US House of Representatives uh, member, uh, Beth Van Dyne, estimates that there will be 14 million illegal immigrants in the United States by the end of 2024. That has all been made to happen. Just in the same way, with one decision, the Afghanistan withdrawal, that whole country and many other parts of the Middle East can descend in the dregs with this one presidency, the whole, the border crisis has been completely inflamed. We, President Biden, when he took office, stopped construction on the border wall. He also reversed President Donald Trump's remain in Mexico policy and instead has this catch and release policy allowing illegal immigrants to go into the United States pending their asylum hearing. And of course, very few of them show up. There has been an astronomical influx of fentanyl coming into the United States, made in China, brought into the United States by Latin American drug cartels. That's just another thing that has gone terribly wrong. Also pertaining to the Middle East, we not only have allowed terrorist activity to proliferate, by withdrawing from Afghanistan and also lifting sanctions on Iran. How about that? Now Iran, which was pretty much broke under President Biden, is now cash flushed. We also have entreated to those regimes and emboldened them through our energy dependence. President Biden promised when he took office that he would not drill 
And he's gone back on that a little bit. We know the Willow Project in Alaska is one such example of where he has allowed drilling because it has been such a disaster to not allow drilling. But we have entreated to the Saudis. We have entreated to the Venezuelans, two dictatorial, especially Venezuela, evil regimes, and begged them for oil, which is so stupid for so many reasons, because if you're focusing on climate change, so it's it's okay if they drill and they allow fossil fuels when they're drilling, but then if we drill, it's bad. Either way, somebody's drilling. And we're entreating to our adversaries, making them rich, making ourselves dependent on them in order for them to send us oil to avoid a kind of, you know, political mess. Yes. In, in, in Venezuela, uh, since Biden became president, he released the uh, restrictions we had on Venezuela. They were they had sanctions on them. They were not allowed to process their oil in the United States, and he lifted those under the auspices that they would have a fair election, which I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Venezuela and a fair election. Yeah, nope. Lifted sanctions on Venezuela, lifted sanctions on Iran. Even uh, during Pre President Trump's time in office, he suspended U.S. funding to UNRWA, which is the, the U.N. agency that gives aid, they say, to Palestinians in Gaza, but we have found out that many of them are were behind the October 7th attacks. He suspended funding to UNRWA. Uh, President Biden reinstated that. Many of you are very well aware uh, from my discussions on China how much things have changed, how under President Trump he certainly didn't have a perfect policy on China. In fact, I think he should have been much harsher, but he slapped tariffs on China. He also froze the accounts of many uh, individuals in the Chinese government who were found to have been behind the massacring of Uyghurs. He also conducted military uh, training uh, exercises in the South China Sea as China was encroaching there. And then President Biden takes office. Not only is there a spectacular amount of evidence that he is bought off by China, but he allows spy balloons spy bases, buying farmland, fentanyl, you know, infiltration into our schools with Confucius Institutes. And he also gives credence to China when they are trying to subvert the United States. For instance, when that spy balloon traversed over the United States, President Biden gave credence to them by saying, eh, they probably just didn't mean it. Let's watch the video. On China, Mr. President, um, can uh, Secretary Blinken ease tensions with China on this trip, do you think? Sure, well, look, um, China has some legitimate difficulties unrelated to the, unrelated to the United States. And uh, I think one of the things that, that balloon caused was not so much that it got shot down, but I don't think the leadership knew where it was and knew what was in it and knew what was going on. Was, I think it was more embarrassing than it was intentional. And so uh, I'm hoping that over the next uh, several months, uh, I'll be meeting with Xi again and uh, talking about legitimate differences we have, but also how those areas we can get along. That's a great strategy to say to our biggest adversary when they spy on us, eh, they probably didn't know it was happening. It was just more embarrassing for them than intentional. He furthered that in the State of the Union, not this past year, but the year before, when he said that we're in the best position ever against China. Before I came to office, the story was about how the People's Republic of China was increasing its power and America was failing in the world. Not anymore. Today, we're in the strongest position in decades to compete with China or anyone else in the world. Anyone else in the world. As if this is, uh, these are not enough examples, I'll give you one final one. Russia. So we've talked about the Middle East, China, the southern border, Russia. During President, Bi or during President Bush's presidency, Putin invaded Georgia and actually still controls about 20% of the country of Georgia. During President Obama's presidency, Putin invaded Crimea and parts of the Donbass in Ukraine. Nothing under Orange Man Bad's presidency. And then, of course, when President Biden took office, 
Putin invaded Ukraine. And remarkably, a few weeks before that invasion, in fact, less than a month before that invasion, President Biden seemed to say that it would be okay if Russia had a, quote, minor incursion in Ukraine. Russia will be held accountable if it invades, and it depends on what it does. It's one thing if it's a minor incursion and then we end up having a fight about what to do and not do, et cetera. So all of these examples are just to say that this Afghanistan story is a piece of a much larger reality here of how quickly things have descended. And I think the final thing that I'll ask, and it's a question that always plagues me and interests me, is when is it going to be enough? I mean, how many things have to go so disastrously wrong under President Biden, both domestically, but obviously for the purposes of this conversation internationally, for us to wake up and realize how bad this president is? And as much as people may have qualms and very legitimate, I, I acknowledge qualms about Donald Trump, none of this was happening when he was president. It's just the truth. I, I would throw one more thing on top of that, that, yeah. that China has been eating our lunch man on is lithium. Yeah, the, that's a great, great The mining, great harvesting, and processing of lithium, they are so far ahead of us, it's disgusting. And meanwhile, we're spending all of this money chasing Trump around to see if he, he uh, sneezed today when we should be ahead and fast tracking the process of lithium, not only to mine it here in the United States, but to be mining it around the world and to be the leader on that rather great, than sitting great. behind China's. Okay, okay. Right. No, no, please. It's great. You're absolutely right. I need to do a show on, on lithium. There, there are so many other examples to give. Esteban writes, I can't understand how there's anyone left who's supporting Biden. I completely agree with you. But as I discussed on Timeless recently, Yuri Bezmenov talked about this demoralization, how there's been this ideological campaign by our adversaries and indeed promoted here in the United States domestically by our own citizens to so confuse and brainwash the American people that despite an abundance of information, we're left not being able to draw sensible conclusions, understand and seek out the truth and make good decisions. So, boy, 2024, man. <laughs> that one is going to be a doozy. We're going to we're going to have a lot of shows on that. Not a joke, man. Not a joke. Not a joke. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's let's end a little lighter. We went from super light and tasty to <laughs> very sad. And let's go back to something a little lighter, which is uh, listener emails. Again, you can email me at julie at julie-hartman.com. Love hearing from you. I can't always respond, but very much appreciate what you write. And I want to flag two things, two recent emails that I got from listeners. The first one, someone wrote to me and asked me if I have any liberal positions. Recently on Timeless, we did this segment, which by the way, we're going to do in two, two weeks. Obviously next week I'm in Europe, but the week after that, we're going to bring back this segment and it's called Who Said That? And I played these uh, different clips or put up these different quotes of things that people said and then asked, well, who, who would say that? And the whole point of it is that you think that a very specific person would say that quote, and then it turns out to be the exact opposite. One example I give, I gave, for instance, is Sonny Hostin on The View said, life starts at conception and I am pro-life. So I put that quote up and went, you'd probably expect a right-wing Republican to say that and then showed it with Sonny Hostin on The View because all of us are nuanced people. Yes, I have made it very clear that I am proudly conservative because I want to conserve the principles of the American founding. But... That doesn't mean that on every single thing I am, you know, gung-ho right wing. I, I have talked about, for instance, how I am conflicted on the subject of, of abortion, morally and legally quite conflicted on that. I do believe that it is terminating a life. I do believe that it should be safe, legal, and rare and should be avoided at all costs. I don't quite know if I'm there yet and totally outlawing it. I have immense respect for, for pro-lifers. But that's, that's one thing that I struggle with. Another thing that I would say, because I've been thinking about, about this email, is that, you know, 
one of the things that I detest, and we were talking about this earlier in the episode with, with Lydia, our guest, is how much in this country we say that, you know, women are oppressed or certain minorities are oppressed. And yes, of course, certain women and minorities have have had a not always great history in this in this country. And of course, individuals continue to struggle. But I, I hate that whole mentality because we are so lucky. Look what I was just talking about with Afghanistan, where women cannot leave the home without a chaperone. This whole idea that we're somehow oppressed as women in the United States is such baloney. And I hate that idea. However, speaking of a maybe a liberal take, I will acknowledge that in some ways professionally, it is a bit harder to be a woman. Because, and this was actually spurred, and I'm very curious to know what the chat thinks about this, Sean, I'm, I'm interested to know what you think about this, but it was kind of spurred by a Taylor Swift clip of all things that uh, popped up on my Instagram. And she made this argument that when a woman is assertive, she's seen as bitchy. When a man is assertive, he's seen as powerful or discerning or knows what he wants. And I have to say, I watched that and I thought that was kind of true, where if women get, and I've seen this in media, where if women get kind of feisty and uh, heated on the air, if they're a bit energetic, they're very much criticized. Whereas if men get the same way, it is seen as something that is a thumbs up. And so I guess that's a little bit of a liberal take I have, but I don't really think that's liberal. Like, I just think that's just common sense. I say this all the time with, with conservatism, you know? I, I mean, I'm proud to want to conserve the principles of the American founding. There are things I am conservative on, but a lot of the things I believe, like, oh, I don't know, a strong border, respect for law enforcement and police, a meritocracy, love of country, the, the fact that there are only two genders, I don't consider that to be conservative. I just consider that to be common sense. What do you think? Do you think that Taylor Swift quote that I repeated and said I had some understanding for is liberal, conservative, accurate, not accurate. What do you oh, think? I, I agree with you about the framework of it all. It seems that uh, everything has to be binary, liberal or conservative. Totally. I don't true. like those labels. I think labels. you seek truth. I think you seek yes. common sense. And I think most people do that, but it gets labeled in other ways. Uh, like when, when Jordan Peterson came onto the scene and just spoke up for what he believed to be true about uh, using pronouns. And then he, all of a sudden he was labeled a conservative when well, right. he is not a conservative. But if you speak the truth now, you, you are a, a conservative. And that's, that's wacky. We need, to, we need to work on that. Because and there that's, are liberals that's accepting the narrative from the far left. And it's, it's not good. Uh, there are liberals. And as far as being a woman in the workforce, I have I have nothing to say. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> just shut up and smile. <laughs> no, I look. What I was just saying with if you speak the truth, you're conservative. Of course, there are liberals who speak the truth. But you take my point that you, my point is more so that you are not left. You are not a leftist yeah, if you are no, speaking my point the truth. Is, if you say something, rather than someone evaluating what you said based on its factuality... They put you into it, a category. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. You're totally right. But I, I thought that was I thought that was an interesting email. So, second email that I want to do, and if you like this segment, I'll, I'll do more of them, is that I got an email from... I actually get a lot of emails from college students, and, and one individual wrote to me uh, about how lonely she feels at her college. And I, I, by the way, you notice with these emails, I don't say the name. I don't, I don't give details unless you are comfortable and want me to, because I always want to maintain um, anonymity. But this girl was writing about how lonely she feels ideologically, sort of what we were just saying about if you speak the truth, you're called conservative. She was saying, I don't really even know if I'm conservative, but I think there are only two genders and I'm called conservative. But she, she ended the email with this, this, kind of rhetorical or the, the series of questions. And one of them was like, is there any hope for the future with so much bleakness? And I have to say that really, really saddened me. And it really gave me pause because look, on this show, we talk 
all the time about all of the things that are going wrong. Look at what I was talking about with Afghanistan. We talk about crazy DEI stuff. We talk about the border, et cetera. But, you know, I, 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 it's not all doomsday. There really is a case for optimism. We still live in one of the most free, prosperous, tolerant, diverse countries in the world. More Americans, as corny and trite and pie in the sky as it sounds, actually agree on more things than they disagree on. And even though our system is getting a lot worse and I am fighting every day like hell to try to preserve it, we still do overall live in a generally meritocratic good system. And not to totally beat the dead horse with this whole projection and thoughts thing. You can tell it's really resonated with me and I enjoy talking about it. But I think if you tell yourself that you're the, the future is bleak, if you convince yourself, oh my gosh, this is not the country that I you know, thought I was going to live in. I'm not going to have the future I thought that I have. It's gonna, I'm not going to find like-minded people. It's, it's not going to be good. Then you will will that into existence. There will be challenges ahead for us in the United States. There are challenges now and they're coming even more, but that doesn't mean that everything is bleak. There is still love, there's still happiness, there's still friendship, there's still community. It's harder to find, but you can find it. And I just, I, I, I really appreciate that email because I, I, I wanna make sure that I am tempering my commentary with an appropriate amount of criticism, but also with an appropriate amount of optimism. I'm pausing to see if the darling Sean has a... It's okay if you don't. We can call no, it a night, but... No, the only thing swirling in my head is you, you, you were talking about perception and the way you project things into the world, and that can manifest. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was thinking about, as a country, on a macro level, it seems like in the past, maybe I'm romanticizing this, in the past we used to be proud of America and look for the goodness in America. And, and, and in the recent decades, we have been focused on projecting the negativity of yeah. America. And I think collectively, that is bad. That has spiraled us. It has. And you know, as I said on the show, we obviously focus a lot on things that are going wrong. But, but you know, one of the things Sean and I say is that it's very easy to tear something down. It's much harder to build something up. And I hope this is clear, but sometimes it's not clear. When I am tearing down what is going on right now in society, it is actually not coming from a place of wanting to tear down. It is coming from a place of wanting to build up. I wanna tear down the people who are tearing down the system. I have so much faith and love and respect in the American system. I want to preserve it, conserve it, continue it, that when I am criticizing these things, it is because I so fervently believe in something. So there, there is that, that, that I just want to make clear. And of course, on the show, I also do a lot of segments on art, architecture, music, cooking, you know, and part of that is to inspire some optimism because there's so much of life that we can explore. There's so many things that are really cool. And we tend to get jaded, we tend to get distracted and focus so much on what's going wrong. But there's a lot to uh, really kind of immerse ourselves in and get fascinated by. And that I think should give us hope for the future. Kumbaya, Om. <laughs> Very kumbaya -y, uh, commentary. Thank you so much for being here. As always, you can email me at julie at julie-hartman.com. If you want your question read on the air, Make a note of it, and uh, if you want me to, you know, not say certain details, of course I will respect that. And you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Julie R Hartman. As many of you know, I'm going to Europe next week. I will miss you all so much. I know you're wondering what you're going to do without me on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. My God, it's going to debilitate your whole lives, isn't it? Check out the YouTube channel. We'll have some excerpts from old Dennis and Julie's that I think you'll like. Take care, everyone. I'll see you back when I'm 15 pounds heavier. Bye. <laughs>